Welcome to the second half. If you didn't like the first half, this is going to be a little different, so maybe you'll like this better. I don't know, maybe you'll like it less. I don't know. All right, so let's deal with some of the more practical aspects of, of the irradiance. The most pressing being that these instruments you know, need to fly in space. Obviously, all the, uh, the photons are absorbed in the Earth's atmosphere. You can't make these measurements from the ground. And so you have to have things in space. Sadly, things in space don't always work. Sometimes they break. Um, so here's an example of a time series of the helium-2304 measured with, with uh, the SDO, the EVE instrument on SDO. And here's the beginning of observations, and here's the end of the observations right here. And so what do we do when there's no data? If you want to know what 304 is doing before or after this time series, what do you do? So one thing we could do is we can rely on you know, proxies for solar activity. So as Andres talked about earlier today, the sunspot number is an obvious candidate for a proxy for solar activity. Here's some plots. This is the daily smoothed um, sunspot number going back to you know, 1830s or, or something. This is a, a logarithmic plot, so you sort of see the, the depth of the more recent solar minimum. But, but as Andres was saying, I mean, it's not, it's not completely uh, uh, unparalleled either in terms of the depth of the solar minimum or the lack of, of strong sunspot numbers during maximum. In fact, here are some of the, the more recent solar cycles, um, you know, sort of from, plotted from beginning to end, and uh, with this dotted line being 100. So you can see this is our current solar cycle. This is updated, I guess, a, a week or so ago. Um, and it's, it's, it's peaking out at about 100. But that's not, that's not that different than what we saw in the early part of uh, the last century. Of course, we did have something of a grand maximum in the 1950s, solar cycle 19. This was uh, you know, an enormously uh, strong solar cycle. Um, but our primary goal in, in looking at the sunspot number is to use it as, as a proxy for solar activity so we can extend these three or four observations. This is a great data set because it's very extensive. It goes back to the 1830s or so, or even, even uh, earlier than that. But it is rather noisy, and it has only a modest correlation with a radiance observation. So here's, here's a scatter plot of sunspot number and the helium-2304 uh, irradiance measured with EVE. And you can see the, the correlation coefficient is OK. Um, there's clearly a, a linear relationship, but that's generally a, a lot of scatter. It also has the other property that it can go to 0. There can be a period where there's no sunspots, and, um, uh, and, and therefore, you would basically uh, have difficulty estimating the 304. Another proxy for solar activity is the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. This is a really nice proxy for solar activity. It can be measured from the ground. Um, and it has been measured since the early 1930s. This is uh, Pensington, I think, in, in British Columbia. Here's the uh, the out, um, where they actually make this measurement. I, I, this is the first time I've seen this, and I was expecting something a little grander, but <laughs> it basically looks like somebody's little shack here. And, and, uh, but this is an enormously important uh, measurement um, because of its long uh, time history. Right? And so here's, here's F10 versus time over the last several solar cycles. And again, observations actually start in 1932. So if we make a, a, a regression between 304 and 10.7, we see the correlation is, is somewhat better than it was for sunspots. The, uh, the noise is, is, uh, is reduced. One potential problem is that sometimes it becomes nonlinear. So if you make this plot for uh, a solar cycle which has much higher levels of activity, sometimes you'll see this sort of turnover. And people resort to measuring um, or doing a regression using a composite of, of uh, F10 and its 81-day running mean. Now, there's, there's almost a, a problem with F10. F10 is, is potentially too good, in, in a sense. It's, those, the measurements are so reliable, and they go back basically over the space age. People basically will parameterize their models in terms of F10. For example, that MSIS model that I was showing you in the previous talk, I was showing you a plot of the irradiance and how that was being modulated. But that irradiance was not actually input into the NRL MSIS model for computing the thermospheric density. Right? F10.7 goes in. Similarly, this is the uh, a tutorial for the Wacom, you know, the whole atmosphere uh, community climate model. This is a real physics-based model of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. And to model uh, solar irradiance variability, at least at the shortest wavelengths, 
you basically input F10.7. You don't put the spectrum into the, the, the simulation. You do down here, if you'll notice, this is uh, Judith Lean's model, that NRL SSI. So for, for longer wavelengths, longer than Lyman alpha, you actually are inputting the spectral irradiance. So again, this is, this is something of a problem. You may come up with this great new irradiance observation. Oh, yes? Well, the difficult thing would be that you'd have to reparameterize your model. Like, like the NRL MSIS model, basically they've taken observations and they've done a regression between those density measurements and F10.7. So there's really nothing you can do to fix that other than reparameterizing the model. What, what you would want to do is, is to take the observations and basically look at the spectral range that's relevant to that process. So if you were redoing MSIS, you would, you would look at the soft x-rays, for example. Um, I think it just requires a little more effort on both communities' part. We have to do a better job in taking the solar irradiance, and we, we have those measurements, and we have to sort of press on people doing these models to, to integrate them and do, do the work. Yes. I, I think the LWS program is doing a really good job of, of moving that forward. So I. Yes, so that I think is the perfect solution. Just make a, a focus science team call and, and put it in one of the future ROSES announcements. And I, I think it could be fairly easily done at this point. Sure. Wait, could you repeat that last part? Yeah, I, I think that does play a, a role in the sense that you have these different measurements from different times and they're not, they're not always in agreement. But we, yeah, yeah. say it? 
It, no, 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 no. This is excellent. Thank you, thank you. All right. So let's let's move on to a, a, a slight another proxy for solar activity. This is the magnesium uh, core to wing ratio. So here's a, sort of a slit jaw image that uh, approximates what you would see around the magnesium two H and K lines. And there's really great data now from Iris uh, here. But I, I just had this handy, so I. I I'm going to illustrate it with, with this spectra. And basically, the premise here is that if you look at the spectrum, basically uh, in, in an active region versus the quiet sun, out here in the, the wings of the profile, you see almost uh, identical measurements as you go from sort of the quiet sun to active region. So the, the, the wing is not very sensitive to activity. The core, however, is. So here are the, 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 core, the features in the core, and you see dramatic changes in, in the the emission in the core. And so what people realized a long time ago is that if you take a ratio of the, the core to wing, you can basically get a proxy for solar activity and you get rid of any problems with uh, the radiometric calibration because these are relatively close in wavelength. Right? So people have been measuring this for a long time and they've come up with composite time series. This is the magnesium core to wing ratio over the last several solar cycles. Um, the, the database is a little bit more limited compared to F10 or, um, or the sunspot number, but there's a relatively high correlation with the radiance observation. So here's an example that I put together with 304. So here's the irradiance in 304. Here's the magnesium core to wing ratio. Correlation is very high. And of course, this is a, has to be observed from space. At these wavelengths, this emission is observed in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so another pathology or another potential problem is that you have to put together time series from different uh, um, different satellites. And now, because it's a, a ratio, it doesn't, the absolute calibration isn't a problem, but you have different spectral resolutions, and so it's, it's sometimes difficult to, to meld all of these things together. So here are uh, three quick examples of uh, proxy mo irradiance models that depend on these proxies. By no means is this in a, a complete description. There are probably dozens of these models. Um, I've been showing you some examples from Judith Lean's NRL SSI model which is very nice and then it can, you know, basically covers all wavelengths. And basically what this, the way this model was put together is, is through uh, largely taking data and doing regression with uh, these proxies for solar activity. And that allows you to, to, fork, uh, to, to specify the irradiance as a function of, of time for periods where you don't have these observations. Um, she's done these calculations for the period of 1950 to 2011. And you can actually go to the, the last site and, and download uh, her model calculations, at least those above, above 1,200 angstroms. Here's another example of a model that takes a slightly different uh, approach. This is the satire model that's being developed uh, at Max Planck. And here, instead of using a, a proxy for solar activity, they actually use the images. So they, they, they look at periods extending throughout the, uh, the last 30 or, or so years. And they use full disk magnetograms and continuum images to quantify the fractional area covered by these different um, uh, features, uh, you know, sunspots and, and faculty and network and so on. And they have some theoretical models that allow you to calculate the spectrum, you know, the composite spectrum from adding all of this up. They also do a, uh, an estimate of the, the total solar irradiance. Um, and you can actually download their model calculations here at this website. Finally, uh, here's another proxy irradiance model. This has a special property that they've, they've uh, put a lot of effort into understanding the flare component. So basically what you do is, is you take the, the observations and you do the standard regression um, for the, sort of the daily average. And then you use the GOES data and instruments, uh, an estimate of the, the center to limb variability to come up with the, the flare component. So, so basically you're, you're taking these, the GOES soft x-ray, you're taking the derivative. This gives you um, a, an estimate of the hard X-ray burst, so this would be, you know, give you very uh, impulsive chromospheric emission, um, and then you can use this to, to model the, the more gradual evolution of the higher temperature component. This has actually been used in in uh, applications, so where they 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 use these spectra and calculate some things like the total electron content, which you know the ionization state of the ionosphere and how that changes during a, a solar flare. So all these things re rely on regression. And one of the things I've noticed in my studies is that they don't quite do the regression as rigorously as, as someone who was uh, uh, educated in machine learning would, 
would like. And so I thought I would gratuitously throw in a quick comment on, on how to do a proper regression. And the, the fundamental problem in regression is like if I have some data and I want to I want to fit it to a smooth curve to these this noisy data, right? So say I, I want to say this the data is is some linear combination of these radial basis functions. I don't know how many radial basis functions to, to include. And so what I can do is I can start off with a small number. And so here's this blue line is, is the best fit to the data. Um, but obviously, it's not, it's not very good. So you say, well, I need a little more model complexity. Right? So you add some more basis functions, and you get better. But of course, there's, there's really it's difficult to know when to stop. So you, you start adding in uh, more parameters, and you get even better uh, agreement to the data. But intuitively, you know you've made a mistake. This is, this is ridiculous. You don't expect this to be a proper fit to the data. And of course, there are sort of rigorous ways to do this in a least square sense. But the important thing that I think is missing is thinking about the data probabilistically. You know that the pathology in this sort of model is that as more data comes in, you think that there's a relatively low probability that this super complex model is going to adequately describe the data. Right? And so the, the way to, to, to deal with that is you sort of create artificially this sense of new data coming in by leaving some of the data out in the original fit. Right? And so what you do is say, say you just take some of these red points and you leave it out of your fit. You'll find that, that um, and so what you do is you do the, the fit as a function of model complexity. And you do the, uh, uh, the calculation of like the, the chi-squared on these data points that are not part of the parameter optimization. Right? So does this make sense? So again, you're leaving some of the data out. You're essentially thinking probabilistically. As new data were to come in, a complex model is unlikely to, uh, to, to fit that super complex model. So I create this artificial situation where I leave some data out, and I look at the optimal number of data of, of basis functions as, as a, a function of these excluded points, not the data where I'm optimizing everything. Right? Now, this is sort of an obvious thing, but it's sort of cumbersome to, uh, to, to, to do, you know, implement yourself in practice. And it turns out, there's a methodology for doing this where everything that you would possibly want in a regression is already included. It's called Ga Gaussian process regression. In some disciplines, it's called Krieging. This is, this is nothing new. But this, this, uh, this regression technique has two really nice uh, pr properties. One, it's, it's non-parametric. right? It's sort of like field theory for regression. Just imagine Gaussians everywhere in space. Right? And what you do is instead of thinking about the weights on, on all these Gaussians, you think about the covariance of how rapidly the, um, the, the data points become uncorrelated as you move around in space. Right? So all of the work is done in terms of this uh, um, covariance matrix. Right? So you, you may have an infinite number of Gaussians, but you don't have to work with them. You just work with this uh, covariance matrix. And the other nice aspect is this is all done in a, in a Bayesian context, right? So you have a sort of a set of priors, you have a likelihood, and you're doing the proper uh, competition between those, those two competing terms. And you know, it's actually it's fairly complicated, but there are great references on the web. There's this book, uh, Gaussian Process for Machine Learning, right? And uh, it, all this is described. And you can go to, to videolectures.net, you can see people uh, attending summer schools and giving lectures and describing all of this in, in detail. But at the end of the day, again, what you get naturally out of this sort of uh, formulation is so here are our blue data points. You get this green line, which is the, the optimized fit to the data. But at each point, you get error bars. So you can, you can calculate the one and two sigma error bars for any uh, um, calculation here within uh, your domain. Right? It also does a very nice thing that if you start getting outside of your domain where you don't have any data, these error bars explode and they tell you you're, you're getting off track. Right? And finally, there's a very nice Python package for implementing all of this. So again, I, I don't think that anything that's been done with these regression models in the Eurasis is, is wrong. There are you know, thousands of data points and only a few parameters, but they really don't discuss sort of the proper way to do these, these regressions. All right, so let's, let's think about um, new proxies for solar activity. All right, so we have all these proxies. Uh, we have sunspots. We have the F10.7. We have um, the magnesium core to wing ratio. Let's think about the potential for a new proxy for solar activity. Um, as as uh, was discussed previously this morning, I mean, this, obviously the magnetic flux is very important to all of this. So, and for many, many years, you know, people like Carl and others have, have known that 
as the, uh, the total flux in a region goes up, the, essentially the emergent radiation goes up. This is actually the luminosity. But just think of luminosity as sort of like the, uh, the emitted power or something. So every conceivable measure of, of the radiance goes up as the magnetic flux goes up. And this extends not only to the sun, this is a collection of active regions, but it extends to the quiet sun, um, active regions, and T Tauri stars. And so you always see this nice relationship between total magnetic flux and the radiation that comes out. So here's a, a quick way of illustrating this. So here's some data from the SOHO mission. So over here on the left, I have some uh, helium-2304. And over on the right, I have um, the magnetic flux. And you can see very clearly, as the magnetic flux goes up, the radiance goes up. And you can make a very simple model, and it tracks really, really well. Right? People have known this for a while, but they haven't really used the magnetic flux as a proxy for solar activity. There's one little complicating factor, as, as Andre showed. Um, well, the, the magnetic flux at the limb is hard to measure, right? You're measuring the line of sight flux. One way to get around this is to use the Carrington maps that uh, Andre showed. So you can take basically a Carrington map and turn it into a magnetogram and make much better measurements of the, the magnetic flux on the limb. So if we did that, here's, here's an example calculation. So I took all of the uh, SDO data from HMI, all the, the, uh, the Carrington maps that they, they produced. And I computed the daily total um, unsigned flux. That is, I calculate BR, the radial flux, integrate over the entire disk, and I get a time series that looks like this. All right, and we can sort of validate that against these proxies that we've been talking about. Here's the sunspot number over this period. Here's F10.7. And here's the magnesium core to wing ratio. And you can see just by inspection that this is clearly on the right track. There's a good correlation between magnetic flux and these other proxies. Right, here's, here's some examples of, of plotting this magnetic proxy against the core to wing, F10.7, and sunspot number. You can see the, the correlations are pretty high. And again, the correlation between our helium-2304 and the total unsigned flux is also pretty high. And you might ask, well, we already have all these proxies. What do we need another proxy for? So let's return to the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let's return to the orbital debris problem. What do we need to know in order to predict the trajectory of an object in space? Do we need to know the irradiance today? Right? I mean, that's, that's helpful, but it's not really what we need to know. As someone mentioned earlier, I, I guess it was Stan, you can actually go to the web and you can look at um, these uh, conjunction assessments. So here's a, a quick URL. And you can see here, so this is, I picked out my favorite satellite, Hinode, um, and you can see the uh, the uh, predicted conjunctions with some orbital debris. And here we're getting to like two kilometers away. The, the smallest I've ever seen is 47 meters. That was when they were actually going to do a maneuver. That gives one a little heartburn. Um, but here we have days since epoch. This is the time between the last measurement and the closest approach. So this is, these are you know three and four and five and six and seven days. So it's going to be like seven days between your last measurement and when the conjunction might actually occur. So you need to know. Um, the solar irradiance not only today, you need to know it over the next six or seven days. So we have a forecasting problem. Right? And the way that, that these forecasts are done now is with something very simple called autoregression. That is, you have your irradiance time series, and you basically make a linear combination of your previous measurements to predict your future measurements. Now, I just think of this as a simple polynomial extrapolation of, of the data that you have. And this works pretty well because of the strong rotational modulation that you see in the data. Right? There's a strong rotational modulation, and basically you're saying whatever happened in the last rotation is going to continue on. Right? And so here's, here's a quick test of, of how this autoregression uh, fares. Here I'm, I'm calculating the skill. You know, when you're doing these, the, any forecast, it's important to look at the skill. And so this is the RMS error as a function of time, and the solid line is an autoregressive model to F10. And you can see it starts off pretty small and sort of asymptotes at about 15%. So after about 10 days, your irradiance variability, uh, your irradiance, your knowledge of the irradiance is off by, <laughs> excuse me, about 15%. Um, all right, we'll, we'll skip the rest of the, the details here in the, the skill. But obviously, this is not a, uh, a, an intellectually satisfying way to do forecasting. Right? We, we have a much better sense of how the sun is going to evolve. Right? So if we want to make predictions like this, um, it seems like we should be using the magnetic flux. 
because as Andre said in his talk, we have a really good understanding of how magnetic flux evolves on the surface of the sun. Right? We, we understand differential rotation, we understand meridional flow, we understand um, supergranular diffusion. And so if we have a uh, description of the, the sun now, we should be able to project that into the future using magnetic flux transport simulations. And here I'm showing an example from one of your fellow students here, Lisa. And uh, so this is a simulation that she, she provided me with. Um, and this is a really nice simulation in that what they've done here is they've made a big advance in replacing supergranular diffusion as a pure diffusive process. And they've actually put in the velocity field that's advecting the, the magnetic flux around. Um, so you get these really nice, this really nice simulation. This, of course, is not entirely new. Uh, the Air Force and its ADAPT program has been on to this using a, a somewhat older model um, of, of flux transport. But <laughs> there's a critical component to this that would make it really uh, effective as a forecasting tool. And that's if we could include far side information into these simulations, right? So I, I don't think we're gonna talk about helioseismology at all during the week, but um, Basically, using helioseismology, you're able to forecast, uh, able to identify the presence of large active regions on the far side of the sun, right? And with stereo, the stereo spacecraft are actually on the far side of the sun, making measurements, making observations, and so you can see directly what's there. And so this active region 12192, you know, when it was on the far side, we could, we could see it, both in the helioseismology and in terms of direct imaging. Now, unfortunately, Stereo doesn't have uh, magnetic observations. So we have to do a little fiddling and use um, the, uh, the helium-2304 as a proxy. All right, so here's a 360-degree here's a map, a Carrington map in 304, and this combines stereo observations and AIA observations. Um, and so what we can see is the emergence of an active region, and we can use that to infer some of the magnetic properties of this active region. And then Lisa and... and uh, Ignacio Gartorura have done some simulations where they actually plop this uh, observed active region from the far side into the flux transport simulation, and then they, they compare how it evolves. So here we're looking at the evolution of the magnetic flux from both the observations, and this is, again, we've taken the 304 and we've sort of converted it to uh, magnetic units, and you can see the, the simulation. And so what this does is it gives you this, this ability to model the future evolution of active regions. Um, and of course, what happens in the real model is that when the region comes around, then you take real data and you start assimilating in that into the model. But that doesn't do you any good for things like the orbital debris problem, right? All you can do is with the data that you have now, and you just uh, move that into the future. So this is, I think, really, really interesting work. And this sort of represents sort of the forefront of how we're going to do forecasting in, in the future. <clears throat> All right, so what I've been describing is what do we do when we don't have data all the time? So we have an irradiance time series and we want to extrapolate that into the future or project it back into the past. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk a little bit, what if we don't have any data at all or a very limited amount of data, right? And that's sort of plagued the soft x-rays. As, as Jan was saying, we don't have lots of good spectrally resolved observations in the soft x-rays. We have really nice spectrally resolved observations that have almost all other wavelengths, but we don't have anything down here. So could we possibly use some of this information to infer what this, the distribution of the, the, the flux is down here? And it turns out we can. All we need to know is these three things. We just need to know the volume of emitting plasma, the rate at which, uh, or the, the population density of the upper level. Again, thinking in the quantum mechanics, we have, we have elements, our, we have electrons in this, this upper level, and uh, so we just need to know the density, and we just need to know the transition rate. It seems really easy. This is probably the most deceptive formula in all of solar physics. <laughs> because once you get going, you realize, you know, all hell breaks loose. And you really need to know basically everything there is to know about the solar atmosphere in order to do this calculation. All right, so you do some manipulation, and we won't, we won't go into the details here. Um, but basically, you end up with an integral equation, right? So this is, this is your intensity, this is your emissivity, right? So this is everything that you think you know about the atomic process put into a simple function of temperature. 
And this is the emission measure. This is a, an empirical description of the solar atmosphere. So what you want to do is you want to say, well, I have observations at longer wavelengths. I have all these emissivities that I've calculated in the database. Could I infer this emission measure distribution, this amount of plasma as a function of temperature, and then make calculations at the, the shorter wavelengths where you don't have any data? All right. So here are some example emissivities, just picked semi-randomly. Semi these are calcium uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17 lines. And again, the idea is that since the, the temperature formation for these emission lines is uh, relatively narrow, they basically probe different regions of the, uh, the solar atmosphere. So if you want to measure the plasma at these temperatures, you know, about 4 million degrees, you have to have emission lines like this that, that allow you to, to probe that. These lines don't tell you anything about the million degree plasma. And as I said, I'm not going to describe this in, in too much detail, but there's a really nice uh, book by, by Ken Phillips and, uh, and company on, the, uh, on this in, in all of its uh, glorious detail. So of course, we have lots of observations. This is sort of our solar observatories over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, or 15 years, have been sort of optimized to, to provide data on, on this sort of question. All right, so we have really great observations. Here's an active region. We have uh, spectra from the ICE instrument on Hanodi. We have uh, soft X-ray images from XRT on Hanodi. We have all of the great AAA observations. And we can do things like calculate the emission measure in an active region. All right, so we can take all the spectra here. And this is the emission measure. This is temperature. And just focus on this red line. So this is if we take all of these emission lines, and, and try to synthesize or invert the emission measure distribution, we get something like this, right? And so, uh, you know, you can sort of look at this as sort of a double power law peaked at about 4 million degrees. So armed with this, this is what I showed earlier, we can take data from the full sun and we can calculate the, uh, this emission measure distribution. So again, this is the red line, it's the emission measure distribution. And this is something we've inferred from, from full disk observations and it's basically telling us the amount of plasma as a function of temperature on the sun. And we're particularly interested for the soft x-rays in this high temperature stuff, you know, a million degrees and above. And once we have this distribution, we can calculate the spectrum. So here's, here's an observation of the irradiance as a function of energy. And uh, um, you know, it matches pretty well. Our, our DM calculation matches pretty well with the observations. Of course, as as Ed was saying uh, during the breaks, that looks awfully suspicious, that good agreement. But this is you know, eight orders of magnitude. It's a good piece of advice. You know, plot all of your data logarithmically over eight orders of magnitude, and your models will always look good. Um, and so we can also calculate this as a function of wavelength. And, um, and this is the sort of information that we need for simulations that, that Jan does. So here's a, uh, an example of how to do this you know, in, a, in a different context. So these are some emission measure distributions taken from you know, Skylab data a long time ago. Now let's just focus on the emission measure in the quiet sun here. So basically what we can do is we can take this quiet sun emission measure, which covers this really broad range of temperatures, and we can synthesize all the optically thin emission in the EUV. And then we can add in some of this optically thick emission, some of the stuff that we require radiative transfer calculations to, uh, to estimate properly. And we can come up with a uh, composite spectrum. So this is a calculation I did a long time ago. Um, the green line is, is the resulting you know, EUV spectrum, all the way from you know, down here at a, a few angstroms, all the way up to about 1,200 angstroms. And uh, just before the SDL launch, they, they had a, a, a satellite, or a an EVE calibration flight, and they return this, uh, this uh, other spectrum. And so you can see you know, there's pretty good agreement here between what we modeled and, and what is observed. And so this is sort of a technique for taking data, coming up with an empirical description of the atmosphere, and sort of inferring this, the spectra when we don't have any observations. Of course, now the, this, this uh, calculation has been superseded by the actual observations, but it was a very useful thing to do at the time. All right, so we come here to the end. And I thought to myself, if I was sitting in the audience, what would I want to uh, tell myself if I was really early in my career? Like, what sort of skills am I missing? What am I doing wrong? 
And so I made this, this slide here, which is just some random thoughts. And of course, you're free to disagree with anything I've, I've written here. But I think it's important to realize that as, as physicists, this is sort of the hardest thing that you can do as a human being, just about. Right? You really have to master a lot. You have to master all the physics, but you have to have lots of other skills. You have to have, be very good at computation. You have to um, know how to write. You have to know how to give a talk. Um, and these are all really difficult skills. You know, giving a talk, uh, communicating effectively is difficult. Writing effectively is very difficult. Uh, people generally don't get excited when you give them a copy of your paper. Right? If it's poorly written, they're going to get, you know, they're just going to ignore it. So as far as computation is concerned, I think we're sort of in a transition. I mean, I don't know about you, but, but when I came in, everyone is, was doing IDL, at least in solar physics. Are we all basically doing IDL? Um, you're not doing IDL? So, and obviously for now, I think we're still stuck with that a little bit, particularly if you work on solar missions. But the future is clearly something like Python. My, my son is actually an undergraduate in computer science at Stanford, and um, they, he has not heard the, the phrase IDL mentioned a single time. You know, so it's just not something that, uh, that, that, that young people are learning. Um, and of course, he, you know, he's encouraged me to learn Python, and I've, I've done a little work in that direction. I think it's important to know some compiled language like C. IDL and Python are both have a pathology that are pretty slow. It's always good to be able to use something that's compiled for speed. So you always have that, that tool in your back pocket. Of course, everything should be object-oriented. You should learn how to use version control. Um, I finally was convinced of this. I learned SVN, and then all the cool kids went and learned Git. So um, that's uh, uh, you know, a bit of an annoyance. And I think it's also important to spend some time thinking about algorithms. I think as, as physicists, we often dismiss algorithms. But there's a huge difference between n log n and n squared. Right? If you don't know what I mean, you should, you should find out. So the, the way we usually do things, and it's great to do it like for your first pass. You write code that's kind of sloppy and, and not optimized. But when you're going to produce something you're going to put in a scientific paper, you really want to adhere to these things. You want to think about your algorithms. You want to have version control. You want to have everything you know, well documented. It's, it's sort of the Achilles heel of, of, of science uh, computation. I mentioned brief, brief, briefly uh, Bayesian inference. I think some of the, the older generation think this is a fad. This is not a fad. Everyone, in some sense, is doing Bayesian inference now. Um, they just don't know it. They basically have a flat prior. So I think, I think properly understanding statistics is an important thing. Um, and of course, as I said, learning how to write and give a talk is very important. Right? And uh, I was very lucky. My, uh, my first boss as a postdoc was a very good writer. And he insisted that everything be written very clearly. Right? And so it was a little painful at, at the front. At the beginning, he would come and say, Harry, you know, uh, the point of a scientific paper is to say things clearly and correctly. All of this is going to have to go. <laughs> and so you know, I, you know, I put some effort into learning to write. Another thing that's really difficult is giving a good talk. It's very difficult to communicate these technical ideas. But people put a lot of effort into uh, and to giving you a guide, uh, a guide for this. And so there's some great books like Presentation Zen by Carl Reynolds or uh, Slideology by Nancy Duarte. And Nancy Duarte is, is essentially famous. She worked with Al Gore. And the, the joke is she helped Al Gore win the, uh, the Nobel Prize for PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> but they, they have some really good uh, um, tips for making good presentations, trying to make everything very visual, trying to tell a story. You know, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I, I strongly recommend these books. Some more practical advice. I think we tend to underestimate the value of a mentor. My mentor was actually Jim Klimchuk at NRL. And uh, I don't think he really, um, and that was sort of a formal assignment, right? But we never talked really as, as mentor and mentee. But I did look to him as a mentor, somebody that I tried to emulate in terms of the way he, he handled himself at meetings. He was always in the front row asking questions. Um, and I think, I think there's this, uh, uh, perhaps a variation on that is, is it might be good to have three mentors. Somebody who's senior to you can sort of lead you along. Somebody that's your own age that you think is sort of comparable in skill level, somebody you can talk to. And someone younger who you think, wow, that person could take my place very easily. So I want to watch what they're doing, and, and I want to learn from them. A quick question about jobs, right? One of the things to watch out for that I didn't fully appreciate when I was a young postdoc 
is that if you're on soft money, you're going to spend your life writing proposals. Right? So you have to think very hard about what sort of position you want. You want to think about your day job. If you're a professor at a university, your real job is, is teaching students. Right? That's, they're paying the bills. And research becomes sort of a, you know, something you can do when you can get funding. Now, it's great to be on soft money when, when you get, get it, because then you're doing research 100% of the time. As I said, I've only spent one hour teaching students in my entire life. But I've spent a lot of hours uh, writing proposals and, and working on, on big mission things. And finally, the last thing I want to leave you with is, is don't be afraid. I think that's the number one thing I would tell myself going back in time, talking to my, myself at a summer school like this. You're always worried, how am I going to get a job? How am I going to pay, pay the bills and all these things? And don't worry, it all works out. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>